Great. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Beth. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mr. Urban Futures. It's been a fantastic week. And congratulations to the Sheffield and Manchester team for this fantastic conference. And I'm really happy to be here today. I'm going to talk today about climate change, uncertainty, and the city. So in doing so, I build on long-term uh, research uh, with um, at current as well as past with colleagues and partners across several institutions and across several projects. So all the logos are up there uh, of the different collaborators as well as funders. But my current project is called Tapestry, which is part of the Transformations to Sustainability program, which is funded by the Belmont Forum, North Face, et cetera, et cetera, lots of different funders, which looks at transformation as praxis in marginal environments facing climate change and uncertainty. And the other project I'm focusing is on is on climate change, uncertainty, and transformation, which was funded by the Norwegian Research Council. And I'll also build on earlier work on access to and contestations of water, questions of citizenship and rights, and questions of justice, <coughs> injustices in cities, pretty much what Mr. Urban Futures is all about. So I'm focusing on climate change, and I think in this day and age, uh, all of you have are aware of this. Maybe some of you have marched on the streets or you have children who've walked out of school and marched on the streets. We're living in this climate emergency and the inspiring words of Greta Thunberg has shamed the world leaders and polit politicians regarding inaction on climate change and this has sparked off a global movement. Um, I was also happy to hear earlier this week that Sheffield has declared a climate emergency and plans to be zero carbon in advance of the official UK targets. So this is fantastic that climate change is now mainstream and has captured the action of youth and galvanized action all over. But I think there are some questions that we need to ask. One is that many countries in the global north and south, despite declarations of decarbonization, the green economy, the ocean economy, commitments to solar, wind, etc., it still is a case of fiddling while Rome burns with structural inequalities and mainstream trajectories of development and modernization remaining unaltered and unquestioned. And it's also important to question some of the simplistic and apocalyptic framings in slogans such as the climate emergency. Our wider questions concerning north-south disparities and injustices addressed. What about questions concerning consumption, production, race, class, gender, etc. An apocalyptic narrative aimed to provoke a warlike emergency can also be potentially dangerous because it can undermine the commitments to a deliberative democratic citizen-led pro process. And also such framing can potentially blank out the socio-political dimensions of how climate has highly differentiated impacts. This kind of framing often tends to make climate change as the root cause of all the ills and all the problems. For example, the cause of conflict and displacement, which is very contentious, and can focus away attention from underlying drivers of vulnerability. And finally, while scientific numbers, and there is a scientific consensus, and thank God we have that, especially in the age of Trump and others, we do have a scientific consensus on climate change. Most climate scientists will also agree about issues concerning uncertainty regarding the extent, impact of climate change, especially at the local level. And this is the focus of what I want to talk about today. So to clarify, I fully support and am excited to see masses of people who feel empowered to stand up and you know, do action on climate change. But I think we also need to look at certain aspects that are probably missed in the debate. And here is where a critical social science lens comes to my help in terms of uh, political ecology, feminist studies, feminist political ecology, science technology studies, etc., uh, alongside with some of the more recent work on transformation and co-production. So I'll aim to chart some of these contributions before focusing uh, on my case, which is um, South Asia, in, and in this particular case, I focus on India. Though our project tapestry also is looking at Bangladesh, but I won't focus on Bangladesh because that's largely rural and this is an urban uh, conference and talk. So what I'm going to talk about is concept how do we conceptualize climate change, transformation and uncertainty, uh, a little bit about the urban challenge and the context of Mumbai, uh, look at some of the transverse transverse co-production in a little patch in the city, Bombay, and also look at some potential for transformation and then I conclude. I also have photo voice at the end and if there's time I'd like to show that but we'll see how 
time goes. Okay, so these are sort of uh, bottom-up perspectives and people's own uh, photographs of how they understand some of these issues. So why do we talk about uncertainty and climate change? Climate shocks and stressors such as cyclones, floods, droughts, changing rainfall patterns and extreme temperatures are some of the examples of uncertainties that we all deal with. Planners, scientists, local people in the global north and the global south. Um, and these combined with the uneven impacts of capital expansion are threatening people's well-being, sense of place and identity. And these also exacerbate the vulnerabilities of marginalized communities. So while there's consensus around uncertainty, its integration in climate change decision making is very dis disputed. How do we deal with this so-called uncertainty, the wicked problem, the monster? And the starting point for me in the project and for all of us working on this was that ecological uncertainty is usually conceptualized from above by scientists, by experts, etc. But how attuned are these with how local people live with and understand uncertainty as well as climate change? Um, and while uncertainty is often a cause for anxiety for all of us, for rich, poor, vulnerable people, especially vulnerable people, can it also be an opportunity for transformation? So that's sort of what um, the, the basic question is. Climate change related uncertainty refers to the inability to predict the scale, intensity and impact of climate change on human and natural environments. And uncertainties and projections are very high. But however, combined with other drivers of change, with economic and political drivers, they make the local level impacts very difficult to understand. And despite the limitations of quantitative assessments, um, it's the modeling and the quantitative assessment that largely prevails. So the question is, can we incorporate and open this up to also incorporate other ways of knowing and understanding some of these issues? So let's just look at some of the critical social science takes on some of these issues. Because of the climate situation, climate change, the UNDP calls it the defining human development issue of our generation. There's lots of calls for transformative adaptation, transformation. And here transformation is not something that's just incremental, but it's about shaking up and changing the whole trajectory of development and addressing wider stru social structural issues. One can't really deny that, but political ecology and other disciplines have asked us to focus on some of the politics and political economy of some of these issues. We need to ask questions concerning adaptation for whom, resilience for whom. None of these are very uh, easy or straight cut issues. And climate is not necessarily out there. It's not just one additional stressor that we're dealing with. Rather, it's as part of social and biophysical forces through which lived environments with all the ingrained inequalities and forms of power are actively yet unevenly produced. So this is uh, Taylor from a political ecology perspective. And while there's a lot of focus on the Anthropocene, that is humanity's impact, and the fact that we've entered a new geological age, the Anthropocene, clearly there is unevenness on how these processes play out in different parts of the planet, or why and how these shifts affect different local species or social groups. And a lot of the origins of the Anthropocene are based in very inequitable global processes from the very outset. And that's why people like Malm and Moore urge us to talk about the capitalist scene, the fact that it's largely capitalist expansion and capitalist penetration that has caused the project a uh, problem in the first place. And from feminist approaches, we understand the need to break all this down in terms of looking at gendered uh, access to rights, also intersectionality, Questions of deconstructing scale, so really looking at scale from the very, very micro level in terms of bodily experiences and understandings to the very global, at the level of global political economy and global politics. So it's important to look both at the embodied experiences of climate change and vulnerability between different peoples as well as humans and nature, but also at what's happening at the global scale. And finally, from the feminist critiques of knowledge as well as from science technology studies, we know that all knowledge is multiple, situated and partial and locally grounded. So this would mean that even the knowledge of scientists, climate scientists, is going to be shaped by particular cultural and social contexts. And it's not necessarily an objective science that's out there. Uh, but all knowledge, whether it's scientists or local people, is going to be grounded and situated. And there's been very interesting work, for example, looking at feminist glaciology, you know, what ice means from different perspectives, why we, s we know that ice is melting, what that means in different cultural contexts is going to be very different um, according to the cultural and social and political issues. 
So when we look at climate change from below, I follow Sheila Jassen of Skoll in terms of synchronizing scientific framings with the mundane rhythms of lived lives and specificities of the human experience. Because climate uncertainties and climate change impacts are going to be exacerbated by livelihood practices, social difference, and multiple drivers of change. And very often these are very difficult to capture in scientific assessments, in models. From anthropology we know that there are social meanings and they interact uh, in multiple ways with ecological worlds. Um, so local people make sense of weather patterns, variability, and also permanent climate change. And climate change is one of the many causes that bring about manifold changes. And it's deeply located in particular places. Um, also, people living in uncertain contexts, be they in dry lands, in vulnerable coastal areas, in wetlands, are used to living with uncertainty, and they've developed indigenous knowledge and repertoires to deal with this kind of unpredictability and rhythms. So we're talking about indigenous knowledge, but obviously indigenous knowledge could have certain limits. Uh, there are limits to indigenous knowledge to cope with a kind of radical uncertainty that probably climate change uh, presents. It's also important to look at institutional arrangements and the context within which climate change is understood. Um, and the political economy of climate change uncertainty. For example, uncertainty like scarcity, I've done a lot of work on the politics of scarcity, can you manufacture to meet certain political ends? Uncertainty can be used as an excuse to do nothing. Uncertainty can be used as an excuse to, to for certain ends. So you often have poor people, vulnerable people displaced from certain areas in the name of climate change. So you could have floodplains, mangroves, creeks, vulnerable areas, ecological areas where um, you know, there's a certain politics around it. And finally, from people like Kristen Hustrup, we know that everybody, be they local people or scientists, are all anticipating the future in different ways. So people, everybody, are, we're all attempting to predict, forecast, and prepare for both the immediate and distant future. So anticipation is a tactic that's employed both by people in specific places, as well as by scientists and experts. So we're talking about different practices of anticipation and different tools that people draw on in terms of predicting and understanding the future. So in Mr. Urban Futures, I don't think I need to say very much about this. You all know about the urban challenge and what it means. And cities are major sites of land use change, carbon emissions, consumption and production. Um, and to make life better in the city, to make cities green, you can offset activities that can also shift environmental risks to the periphery. So you can also get rid of certain people, get rid of pollution, get rid of certain practices, and shift the issues elsewhere. As we heard throughout this week, cities are sites of huge inequalities and injustices, and there are massive vulnerabilities, both social as well as ecological. Many coastal cities, major coastal cities that are uh, going to face climate change, actually are on very fragile, ecologically vulnerable areas, mangroves, creeks, uh, reclamation, uh, sea level rise, etc. But still, we often find a kind of business as usual that's, that, that carries on in these cities. You have uh, property bonanza, you have a lot of development, a lot of infrastructure, and especially the city I'm going to focus on, Bombay, where you, know, you would almost assume that they, they don't care about climate change, just in terms of the developments along the coast. And here, it's very nice to look at this quote by Jane Jacobs. Uh, there is a quality even meaner than outright ugliness or disorder, and this meaner quality is the dishonest mask of pretended order, achieved by ignoring or suppressing the real order that is struggling to exist and to be served. So I think this really highlights the brutalities of life uh, in, in cities in terms of the inequality, also in terms of urban planning and whose priorities count. Finally, cities are expanding, so they expand to the hinterland, um, and a peri-urban is a particular context where you almost have organized irresponsibility. Uh, you have shrinking farmland, you have urban spaces, you have a lot of competing jurisdictions. These are sites where people, there's a flow of people, industries, pollution, waste, and the peri-urban often falls between the cracks. So you have this kind of organized irresponsibility regarding service provision, but also in terms of um, environmental justice. And there's a continuum between uh, legality and illegality, especially for the most poor and vulnerable citizens here. 
And these are also sites of deep injustices and human rights violations in most parts of the global south. We're talking about citizens who are non-citizens, people who don't count because they don't have the paperwork, uh, they don't have the tenure, they're not provided uh, basic services. The whole idea of universal so service provision does not uh, relate to them. So Chatterjee refers to these people as political society. They acquire services through wits, stealths, etc. Second class citizens of, um, and you, you know, really uh, go through gross human rights violations. And this kind of legality, illegality continuum or visibility, invisibility interplays what shapes their lives. And this is the context through which climate change is understood. And when we're talking about justice, I'm referring both to uh, the lack of distributive justice, but also the lack of voice. You know, they often lack voice in terms of official um, fora, lack recognition, but also a lack of, it's also a sense of cognitive injustice. So their perspectives and framings around the city, around their rights, around pollution, around waste just do not count. It is often an official framing that will count. So it's also a question about reframing and reshaping some of these official discourses um, around environmental justice and rights that matter. So what is uncertainty? Um, it's a situation of indeterminacies where not enough is known about the probabilities of a particular set of outcomes and they cannot be calculated. So you can talk about risk where you have probabilities that can be calculated, but uncertainty is a situation where we don't know what we don't know. And there are roots in many disciplines. There are many ways to understand it. Um, but usually one tends to distinguish between knowledge uncertainties or epistemological uncertainties and ontological ones. That is the kind of uh, uncertainty in, ex in, in the being. And official responses have tended, as a whole body of scholarship tells us from science technology studies, have tended to be inadequate. So there's been a tendency to control uncertainty and treat it as risk rather than embracing it or living with it. Um, but what's interesting is that people often living in very vulnerable spaces uh, in dry lands, in coastal areas, have learned often to live with uncertainty, but they often have this techno manageries, man managerialism that is thrust upon them. But as I also have just said, uh, uh, climate change does pose a kind of radical uncertainty uh, that often we don't have the repertoire to deal with it. So in our projects, we came up with a heuristic, which is slightly simplistic, but it does serve the purpose um, of distinguishing between the domains of above, middle, and below. And obviously, people go across these different domains. So when we talk about above, we're referring to uh, the official accredited knowledge of the scientists, of government officials, donors, policymakers. They tend to take a longer time frame. It's more global in scope. Um, and this is also... Uh, where power counts. So this is the official accredited knowledge um, which tends to count, which has, they have more convening power and often they draw on statistical tools, probability methods, etc. We then also focused, bet we fo looked at the below, which are local people, which obviously are very heterogeneous. They can be rich, they can be poor, women, men, distinguished by class, ethnicity, race, gender, caste, etc. And for the below, one tends to look at a shorter frame, so it's more in terms of weather and its changes rather than looking at the long term. Um, it's often experiential, um, indigenous understandings, and this group is uh, used to uncertainty very often, uh, but, it's, but, but obviously climate change amplifies things and there are also amplification of local impacts due to changes in political economy. And then there is this group in between, I guess most of us in this room would be part of that group. We are knowledge brokers, intermediaries, or street level bureaucrats, activists, uh, where there's a kind of hybrid uh, knowledge and there's a translation across these diverse experiences and perceptions. But of course, sometimes people move across and sometimes um, it's more difficult and they often don't communicate with each other. So we did a lot of interviews with a lot of scientists, climate scientists in India, in Europe, and clearly, a lot of them focused on uncertainty in climate change as a monster or super wicked problem. Um, but despite acknowledging the difficulties of trying to capture uncertainty, there was still a primacy of com computer models and that kind of modeling. Uh, there was frustration due to policy processes, politics, and I'll talk about that in the minute. But still, there was always this focus on improving the model. Um, and we didn't find much evidence of scientists really trying to open up their repertoire and try and learn from 
different understandings, local people's understandings, or different forms of understanding climate change and uncertainty. So some of the issues that came up, especially in the urban context, were um, how you actually predict what's going to happen in a city like Bombay, for example. There's uncertainties in future emissions. The whole issue of aerosols came up a lot and how aerosols could, sh could you know, have an impact on cloud cover, but you don't end up actually predicting rainfall based on that. So that leads to a lot of complication. Um, the whole issue of downscaling and the problem of scale. So in the Indian context, it, the resolution issue was a big thing. You know, the sh smaller the resolution, the better the prediction will be, but it was very difficult in an urban context. And the Indian monsoon is extremely notorious in terms of understanding it. So I think scientists were, cap were really grappling with that, whereas temperature was easier for them. So this nice quote really highlights uh, the kind of dilemmas faced by climate scientists. And also within the city, they said that um, the urban heat effect, buildings, etc., could really uh, have an effect on urban precipitation. And some of these issues were very, very difficult to capture in the models. I think I've done that. So our approach, I should have had this earlier, sorry about that. Uh, we did multi-sited and ethnographic work. We also did archival work in each of our sites. And these were some of the methods. It was largely qualitative, but we also have had some biophysical studies. Um, and it's a sort of engaged process of situated learning, working with locally based partners who both research as also co-produce transformation. Um, in this current phase, we are doing interdisciplinary as well as transdisciplinary work. And we've tried to use other methods such as photo voice, round tables, exhibitions to also draw on other uh, methods, visual methods to try and translate across the domains. So these are our different study sites, but I'm going to largely focus on the city here. Um, you know, we're focusing on India and Bangladesh, marginal environments that are facing with different effects of climate change, uh, extreme weather events, sea level rise, cyclones and droughts. They're very unpredictable and also the local level impacts are difficult to understand. So the city Bombay is a um, maximum city. It's got more billionaires than I think different, you know, the UK <laughs> probably, <laughs> but it's got 50% of its population living on the streets or in informal settlements, so huge inequalities. It's a coastal mega city affected by sea level rise, chronic flooding, environmental pollution, and highly vulnerable to climate change. And obviously, whatever is happening in terms of climate change will intersect with uh, urban political economy, um, institutional array, insecure livelihoods, and largely, the planning has been has not really focused on distributive, ecological, or civic issues. So in the city, we focused on issues of flooding, the mangroves. Interestingly, the city, uh, if you know the history, was seven islands that then were reclaimed and formed a big city. So there's obviously they've built over mangroves, creeks, rivers, and that's part of the problem. Um, because it's just a building bonanza and not really respecting the ecology of the area. And so we've been looking at questions of uh, mangrove restoration, also um, the livelihoods of the Kohli's, who were the original fisher folk, the fisher folk and the original inhabitants of the city who live on the fringe, and questions of water and waste management. And we've been working with uh, a group, an NGO called Bombay 61, also with uh, um, activist conservation action group that has been doing very successful legal cases about illegal constructions on the mangroves, and finally with a government agency. But the work with the government agency is not going very well. Uh, maybe, maybe it'll get better. So what do people, different people say? So the below has been talking a lot about unpredictability in terms of the rainfall, the heat waves. Uh, fishers are complaining about the problems in terms of meeting their livelihoods. They can't get catch. Their traditional knowledge is becoming obsolete because of the changes in the waves and the weather and climate patterns, and livelihood uncertainty has increased. The middle class is largely worried about pollution, about the disappearance of green areas and flooding, but also there's growing activism. Uh, the official, they, people most men generally feel that disaster response has improved, but flood mitigation is very poor. So even though there was a major flood in 2005 and that killed 500 people, there was huge amount of rainfall. Uh, unbelievable amount of rainfall in one afternoon and the city kind of bounced back but in terms of mitigation and dealing with floods it's been really poor because you have chronic flooding coming every few years um, and obviously the uncertainties from climatic events intersect with daily socio-economic and political um, uncertainties 
So there's this little change that has actually happened. And um, what you often have is in terms of flood mitigation, they have new pumping stations. There's been deepening of river stretches. And a lot of poor people in, in vulnerable areas also have also been displaced. 10 minutes? OK, yeah, that's fine. So the middle talks about, agrees that there's climate change is definitely happening. Uh, they're very interested in what's happening, that mangrove restoration should happen. There should be key urban sustainability. Very unhappy with what the government is doing. A lot of cynicism about flood mitigation. Um, very concerned that the river, the Miti, which is, has just been used as a drain, uh, and untreated sewage is chucked into it. So there's no real care of the the ecological spaces within the city, and the fact that money power overrides all other concerns. So basically, that's the city is, city is given up on planning, and it's all about making money. And here are some of the quotes. One of the main threats to the city is real estate prices and land costs. It's so expensive. So the speculators are making a lot of money by reselling the land. And often, you end up displacing people you, in the name of climate change, and then that area is developed. So basically, it's, you know, it's a very cynical way of looking at climate change and uncertainty. So obviously, it's very important to look at the science policy interface. And a lot of the scientists we spoke to and the experts um, struggle with the fact that uh, it's very difficult to communicate some of the issues around climate change and uncertainty and how you communicate with them with politicians. It's quite difficult. Um, because they're working with probabilities, but often people want certainty, so it's quite difficult. But we didn't find much evidence of hybrid knowledges or gaps being bridged between science and policy, or indeed between the different constituencies. And we did a lot of roundtables uh, in all our sites, and we'd really tried to bring different stakeholders together to try and um, explore ways to bridge these different gaps and also to foster transformative, you know, to look at ways in which these issues could come together. So finally, I just want to look at questions of transformation and co-production in the last few minutes that I have. Um, you know, in the climate change debate, it's very important to, to distinguish between transitions that are mediated mainly through technological innovation and, you know, in a particular sector, as opposed to transformation that takes place in wide, more wider in terms of social practices, wider innovations which are deep-seated, uh, which bring about deep-seated structural change, which may be systemic, structured, or enabling. And obviously, these are very diverse, emergent issues. They can be very unruly. And it's very important that they challenge incumbent structures and power relations. We spent a whole week talking about these issues. And you know, when is something transformative? When does it happen and when not? And I think that's an issue that all of us are grappling with. Um, and in our project, we've conceptualize this, we're looking at different patches. So these are little sites within these areas that we're looking at. These are seeds or ecological bright spots. Um, and we're recognizing the past structures, the incumbency, and there's obviously obviously going to be trade-offs and goals. Um, in our project, we're looking at transformation as praxis. So here, we're interested in different hybrid alliances between uh, actors, be they NGOs, local people, scientists. And we're looking at whether it's possible to change social arrangements, focusing on the agency of very marginalized people in very vulnerable contexts, and also to open up the debate, look at multiple ways of valuing, knowing, uh, and also the capability uh, to, to change. So this is obviously a rich tradition of theories of social change, emphasizing the interplay of agency and social uh, reproduction, as well as multiple ways of valuing, collaborating, knowing, and doing. Um, and so in, in the city of Bombay, um, we are looking at a particular patch or an area where we're trying to reimagine urban planning, um, resistance to commercial planning, uh, resistance to coastal encroach encroachment, as well as destruction. Um, and I guess, you know, as Beth and others have said, there's a role of bringing different actors together in these charred spaces, citizens, activists, NGOs, and state agencies to see whether you know co-production is possible in realizing just cities so the area that we've been focusing on and i can't say very much about it because we've just started the work um, but this is a fish an old fishing village um, in north bombay uh, vasova koliwada it's a thriving fishing village and these are colis who live here they live they face a very uncertain future as a result of both the loss of livelihood commercial developments as well as global climate change so uh, 
a host of all these factors coming together have created a lot of uncertainties for fishing as a livelihood for their lives. Uh, many of them have sold their boats. They've had to sell them. Also, it's very difficult to get catch. And also, um, the creeks and the mangroves that they live next to and that are crucial for their fishing and their livelihoods have been encroached upon or are used as dumping sites. So there's huge plastic pollution, a lot of waste here. Um, and we've been working with Bombay 61, which is a, a small think tank uh, which facilitates urban design with public participation. And we're also working with, as I said, with the Mangrove Cell, which is a unique entity, and other um, actors in the city. So if you look at this edge here, uh, the creek is where the fresh water mixes with the salt water, making it the best breeding ground for fish, but the pollution levels are absolutely abysmal. So. Um, there's a real mess here. There is some middle class environmentalism now where uh, people have been coming and cleaning up the beach every Sunday. So the beach is cleaner now, but whether it's actually still viable in terms of uh, fishing is, is another question. But there are some, some changes here. Um, and I guess a lot of the solid waste is always comes back here on this beach because of the general pollution and the lack of awareness overall. One could also say that, you know, little cleaning up of the beach here uh, is very cosmetic. It doesn't really address much structural change, but uh, obviously the uh, activists who do that feel good after they've done. So that's great. No, it's good to do that. My daughter cleans the beach regularly in Brighton, so I shouldn't be cynical, but it's, it's more about, uh, you know, looking also at some of the wider structural changes. And this is just an example of a workshop that was held recently. So we're just at the start, and here the team is starting a discourse with the local fishers as well as some of the authorities um, about what is possible in a course of a three-year project. Uh, as you all know, in Mr. Urban Futures too, you know, we, we want to create transformation, but we, there are some constraints in terms of the project cycle. So the idea is to uh, get together with these groups to see what exactly is possible. And some of the issues that have come up are the issue of the creek and the mangroves. Uh, we go, there's a school project that's going to take place in terms of awareness with kids and raising awareness about the mangroves, monitoring some of that, issues of fishing livelihoods, um, et cetera. So I guess this is something that will be, we can, I'll be able to report more on as, as things progress. So I want to just conclude now, and if there's time, I'll show you some photo voice. Um, I've tried to unpack climate change and what it means to different, um, what it means from different perspectives and different knowledge systems. So I've looked at uh, the above, middle, and below, and all of these are very diverse and have different framings and responses to uncertainty and climate change. We're also talking about deep imbalances in the debate. So obviously, uh, you know, the coalies are very disempowered, don't have power, as opposed to people sitting in, you know, government officials. Um, climate change is just one aspect of the uncertainties, and it intersects with other drivers of change. Uh, there's been an official neglect of uncertainty, and this has increased local level insecurities and ill-being. Uh, there's also limits to local knowledge, and these radical uncertainties are pushing local people to the limits of coping. And in a city like Bombay, you definitely find a manufacture and politicization of uncertainty, which colonizes the future. Sorry, that last line is missing in certain ways. I have it here, but it's not up there. So what I meant was you can use uncertainty, like scarcity, to, to colonize the future in certain ways. So you can displace the poor, you can justify certain developments along the coast, etc. And largely the state and national policies have been inadequate. I haven't really had time to talk about this sort of institutional balkanization as my colleague from IIT Bombay says. There's so many institutions, all of them have their mission to deal with some of these questions of climate change and flooding, but you know, they don't cooperate at all. So basically nothing gets done. And that also increases the insecurities um, of local people. Climate change intersects with neoliberal trajectories of growth, resource grabbing, and these also increase vulnerabilities, as I said, with the coalies and others. It's very important to bring to the fore alternative ways of valuation, knowing, and being, you know, reframing some of these so-called marginal spaces. Um, in some of our other sites, in the drylands, it's particularly true because these are seen to be unproductive spaces where nobody's there, but in reality, you have pastoralists there that have camels and they want to you know, carry on breeding them, but, you know, the land is being grabbed. So there you're really trying to reframe these dry lands, not as these very marginal, hopeless spaces, but spaces that are viable. Um, 
and hybrid alliances are seeking to reimagine these environments, these vulnerable, uncertain environments. And um, I guess, you know, um, if they're transformative, they will shake up some of the power relations. They will, and we're very interested in also reframing some of these issues um, in ways that are more bottom up and more focused on what the below things as opposed to uh, the views of the experts. So now I just want to show you, if I may, can I show the, the, the um, photo voice just very quickly? This is my colleague, Shibaji Bose, who's a, um, a media consultant, and he, 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 he used photo voice as a way to um, get local youth and others to capture their own understandings of climate change and uncertainty. So they were given cameras, and this is some of the things that they've come up with. I'm just going to whiz through this very quickly. Thank you. 